emotion, the heavenly anointing that man cannot produce, emotion cannot produce it, intellect cannot produce it, nothing can produce it but the very hand of God. And I know, Lord, that no matter how well I teach or how much information I hear, unless the hand of the Lord is present, that it will really result in very little eternal good. So I pray for the hand of the Lord to be present tonight, the hand of the Lord to be upon me, and the hand of the Lord to be upon the hearers, Lord. If it's not this, this double dyna dynamic, it will surely fail. If the hand of the Lord is on me but not on my hearers, I will preach in the spirit and they will hear in the flesh. Or if the hand of the Lord is on them and I preach in the flesh, then there will be nothing of eternal value, nothing of edification. But Lord, if I preach in the Spirit, and we listen to the Spirit, Lord God, then there will be an explosion, a combustion, eternal power released, heavenly power, the dunamis of God. Lord, life-changing power. And I pray for that dunamis power, that life-changing power, that holy anointing of God that, that builds us up, that edifies us, that strengthens us, that encourages us, that speaks to us, that teaches us all things, even going far beyond the words that are spoken, but it teaches our hearts. It's the Holy Spirit of God. It's the oil of God's Spirit. Lord, um, washing over us, moving upon us, touching us. Lord, moving deep within us. It goes deep into our bones, deep into our souls, deep into our hearts, far beyond where words can go. It penetrates far beyond the spoken word. It goes to the, even to the division of soul and spirit, bone and marrow, the thing that's impossible, humanly speaking, but with God, all things are possible. And you know that's what my brother needs tonight. You know what Lola needs tonight, Lord God. You know what his soul needs, Lord. You know what Jerry needs tonight. You know the word his soul so needs. Lord, you know what Jeffrey needs. You know the word that he needs in his soul. Lord God, you know what Gabby needs tonight, Lord God. The word from on high. Lord God, you know what Jelena needs and what Wopung needs, Lord God. You know what each one of our needs are, Lord. And I pray that you will meet them by your mighty and powerful Holy Spirit. Oh God, I pray that he would be released in this place tonight. That his unction and his power and his presence, his life-giving presence, we move freely in this place tonight. Build up your church through your spoken word, Lord. And build up our lives through your word, through your spirit, through your power. And tear down the works of darkness. Tear down the works of the flesh. Tear down the works of our pride, our impatience, our lust, our anger, our selfishness, our greed, our laziness. Tear down every obstacle. Tear down all the spiritual pride. Tear down all our self-righteousness. Tear down the terrible curse of unbelief and doubt. Tear down the fears. Tear down the things, Lord God, that Satan uses to try to control us. And let us not be controlled by the devil anymore, yes. but let us be totally under the power of God and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not under the power of the flesh, not under the power of lust, not under the power of fear, not under the power of doubt, not under the power of unbelief, but under the power of the Holy Spirit, under the power of faith, hope, and love. Delivered from our, our fleshly desires and our fleshly tendencies and brought under the dominion of the Holy Spirit. That we're no longer sowing to the flesh and reaping corruption, but we are sowing to the Spirit and reaping eternal life. So I pray, Lord God, for a supernatural work by a supernatural God that tonight will be a supernatural evening, a supernatural moment in history where you mark something within our lives, Lord God. Lord, let it be an altar tonight. Let there be an altar here tonight where we say, God spoke to me in that place. God put something in my heart and my life that night. God put something in me. God called me. God spoke to me. God shook me. God transformed me. God awoke me out of a slumber, out of a worldly mindset, and brought me into a kingdom mindset. And I am now on fire for God. I am now on fire to do the will of God. I am now on fire to serve the Lord. 
with the rest of my life. That's all I want to do. In Jesus' name, Lord, let that come upon us tonight, Lord God. Let that unction and that calling come upon us tonight, Lord God. Life changing, directing, transforming, and that we would never go back to where we were before. In Jesus' name. Turn your Bibles if you want to Psalm 49 and 20. First part, I'm going to do a little bit of review. Turn it off. Uh, Psalm 49 and 20 says, A man who is in honor yet does not understand is like the beasts that perish. Remember this verse? We talked about how. The man who's in honor, the man who's in his wealth, the man who's in all of his pursuits and all of his luxury, all of his success, yet does not understand. It's like a beast that perishes. And we made the conclusion that a man who doesn't worship God, he's just an animal. Because really the only difference between humans and animals, main difference anyway, is that we worship God. We have the capacity to worship God, but animals do not. Animals are made to be animals, but we are made to worship God. And when we don't worship God, when we don't seek God, when we don't have a relationship with God, then we are no better than animals. And we are completely denying the glory of our creation. We're denying the main part of our being, the most glorious part, the most noble part of our entire being as a human is that we can worship God, that we can know God, that we can have a relationship with God, that we can pray to God, worship God, hear from God, hear His voice, know His will, and seek Him and pursue Him and have fellowship with Him. This is something the animals cannot do and uh, do not have. So when a man denies that entire part of his being, he denies prayer. He denies worship. He denies, he denies walking with God. He denies all this entire part. Then he denies his, his own glory. And he becomes nothing but a ball of flesh and blood. Just an animal. A beast that perishes. But actually we made the conclusion that no. A man is worse than an animal. When he doesn't worship God, when he doesn't seek God, when his life is not marked by a relationship with God, he's worse than an animal. Why? Because animals were never given that capacity. So they only do what they're expected to do. They eat, they drink, they make babies, and they die. That's what animals do. They don't do anything else. Maybe they sing a song, maybe they dig in the dirt. They don't worship, they don't pray, they don't seek God, they don't walk with God like Enoch did. Because they're animals. They were never made to do that. They were never given that capacity. But we were, and we have it. And when we don't use it, now we are lower than the animals. Now we are worse than an animal. That's why men go to hell. Animals don't go to hell. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that animals go to hell. They, they die, but it doesn't say they go to hell. Men go to hell. I'm so glad I'm not an animal. I'm so glad I'm not a cricket. You know, God made crickets and he made men. I mean, how, you know, who determined that you would be a man? God. And it's a it's a glorious privilege that we have. We're the the what would you mean? We're the the, the the rulers of the universe in a sense. Not of the universe, but the rulers of the earth. We are the ones in control. You know, it's not the a bunch of bears from China fighting against bears from America. It's the, no, no. It's men that want to go to war with each other, right? It's it's men that fight with one another. It's men that, that are are ruling over the everything that's going on in the earth. The animals, they just they're animals. We are men, and we have great potential and great capacities. But on the other hand. The fact that we are men, not animals, means that our responsibility is so high, so high. Think about that. You were made to worship, 
And if you don't do it, now you're going to be judged. You were made to pray and you didn't pray, so now what? Now you face the judgment. You were made to walk with God and you ignored God, so now what? Now you have to face the you have to be responsible. You were made to worship God. You were made to walk with God. You were made to serve God and you didn't do it. So you have to give an account for your denial of your own nature, your denial of your own creation, the denial of the image of God that he's given you. So now who can bear this burden? Who can bear the burden, the fact that we've been given this ability and this, this characteristic and this privilege and we completely denied it. We completely neglected it. I don't know what's worse, being an atheist from China and just completely ignoring that whole thing your whole life or being a so-called Christian from a country like Indonesia who just did it in pretense but not in reality. They just went to church but they never truly worshiped God. They just, they kind of said their prayers, but they never really prayed. I don't know which is worse, an atheist that just denies it completely, or the fake Christian that pretends to do it, but doesn't actually really ever do it. But both are going to face a terrible judgment and accountability for it. That's why we need a Savior. Because of the guilt we've incurred by the fact that we've not lived up to what we were made to be. We've not done what God wanted us to do. We've not done what he commanded us to do. And that's why all men are guilty. And that's why there's a Savior who hung on a cross and satisfied the righteous requirements of God and was risen from the dead. So... If a man doesn't worship, he's less than an animal and will have a great responsibility to God on the day of judgment. Whether he was an atheist and denied it completely or he was a fake sort of Christian that only pretended to do it, it's all equally guilty because we've not done what we were called to do. Maybe you say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a good Christian, and you spend your time in video games, YouTube, entertainment, or even on sports, or on schoolwork, but you don't worship God. You don't walk with God. You don't praise God. You don't live for God. You don't walk, you don't know God. Guilty. 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 Living like an animal. Not all animals are mean. I mean, some, some, some animals are very mean and they'll kill people, even like, you know, a bear or something like that. But some animals are very cute and very, you can tame them, etc. You don't have to be like a bad person to be guilty of the greatest crimes against God. Because the greatest crimes are when we deny God and we deny our own existence that we were made for Him we were made to serve him, that we were made to know him, that we were made to worship him. So you could be the kindest person on the face of the earth, but you're still just an animal. Because you've not fulfilled the purpose that God has created you for, which is to worship God. Praise God. Walk with God. Serve God. Jesus said in Matthew 4,
they immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So, what I want to talk to you guys about tonight is really two aspects. First one is um, that psalm, the verse out of Saul, and the fact that we are made to worship, we are made to, to know God, we are made to walk with God. That man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the second part is that man is made to serve God, to live for God, to work for God. And I'm kind of bringing a separation because it's really, we can kind of categorize two aspects of how we're supposed to live. And the first point is that we are made to worship God. We are made to pray. We are made to praise. We are made to wait before the Lord, reading His Word, meditating on His Word, uh, to fast. This is Friday, we're fasting. We are made to fast and to pray, to draw near to God, and to worship God, come to church, and to hear his word, you're hearing preaching. This is part of what you were made to do. This is a good thing. Never feel you should never feel guilty for listening to a sermon. When you're listening to a sermon, you're actually worshiping God. This is one of the things that God wants you to do as a believer. He wants you to listen to preaching. Listen to the preaching of the word. You're you're fulfilling part of your responsibility as a believer to hear the word of God, to be taught the word of God. So actually tonight there's two different things taking place. One, on one hand, you are fulfilling the first part of our function as a believer, and that is to worship God. You're worshiping God by hearing the word, by listening to the word, by seeking God through, I want to hear from God tonight. Uh, what is God going to speak to me through his word tonight? What is pastor going to preach? What is it going to, what, how is God going to use it in my life? By doing that, by coming here, listening, you're worshiping God. And, and God's made you to do that. And you're fulfilling your noble, part of your noble character, part of your, your, the, your, the image of God in you, which was made to know God, draw near to God, to hear God's voice. When the word of God is preached uh, and accurately, you are hearing the voice of God. This is worship. Now, there's another aspect of this, and it's another part that I want to talk about tonight, that we are also called to serve God, to work for God, to do God's Will, And I'm fulfilling that tonight. I'm working for God tonight. How? I'm preaching the word to you. And this is also something that we're supposed to do. I'm serving God by serving you, by giving you the word of God that I have studied, that I have prayed about, that I have sought God for, that I, that I would have something to speak, that I would have something to give. So I'm fulfilling another part of the Christian life that we also must fulfill, and that is doing God's works. Doing the work of God. Remember Jesus said, the works that I do, you will also do. They were only going to be waiting before the feet of Jesus in praise and prayer and worship and hearing the word of God and studying the Bible. That's one part, and it's the most noble part. Maybe you could say the most number one part. When we see with Mary and Martha, we saw that uh, Mary was waiting at the feet, at the feet of Jesus. Martha was busy doing many things. Now, both of those are actually functions the believer is supposed to fulfill. But what, what's, what's being shown there is the priority. The priority must be that if you must be worshiping God, right? You must be hearing God's voice for yourself before you go and speak to others about what God is saying to you. Amen? You must be worshiping and seeking and waiting on the Lord and studying His Word. Okay, that's number one. But number two, if we're going to number it, then is, but now serve God. How by serving others, by doing his works, by doing his will. And, and you can't deny that part either. You must do both. So I don't believe the Lord was denying what Martha was doing as inappropriate or, 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 not, or not necessary. But I believe what he was teaching was he was prioritizing between 
waiting on God and serving people. Which one is going to become is going to come first? Which one is going to be higher? Of course, waiting on God. Because the just as the great the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself, always in that order. So in the same way, we are called to worship God. Don't be an animal. Don't forget about God. Pray to God. Worship God. Seek after God. Be a spiritual person. People like to say things like, you're so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. Those are animals speaking. <laughs> Just animals. Sorry. When somebody is not spiritual, then they're not fully human. Because God has made humans to be more than flesh and blood. More than creative. More than scientific. More than intellectual. More than artistic. God has called us to be spiritual. And that's how we're made, and that's how we're called. But, and that is the priority, and I think you almost cannot overemphasize how important that is. How important it is that you worship God. How important it is that you talk to God. How important it is that you walk with God. Your life is a life. Wherever you go and anything you do, you're talking to God. You're walking with God. You know, it doesn't have to be a time in your room on your knees alone. Walking down the street, coming into church, in the car, praying to God, talking to God, an ongoing conversation with God, an ongoing lifting up of your heart to God, lifting your life before God, saying, God, here I am. Here I am, Lord God. I walk with you. I talk with you. I want your will. Lord God, speak to me. God, use me. But just constantly, and of course, spending time on your knees. Of course, spending time on your face before God. Of course, spending time together in corporate worship or personal worship. Or, but of course, having those times, but just, it should be a conversation, an ongoing conversation throughout the day, throughout your life. Walk with God. That's what Enoch did. It's like Enoch, I've shared this before, but when it, it, the way it talks about Enoch was as if he was walking, like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That, that's Enoch walked with God. It just means that his entire life was, was one big offering, was one long prayer. <laughs> you know, there's a psalm, I don't remember the exact one it is right now, but it says that I am prayer. They change it a little bit in the Chinese version, they change it a little bit in the English version, but the original language is I prayer. Or in other words, I am prayer. English, I think, changed to say something like, I give myself to prayer. Because that's the implication. It says, I am prayer. That's like, oh, that's, that's, that's what you are. Yeah, I'm just one long prayer. My whole life is nothing but one extended prayer meeting. That's the way to live. A one extended worship session. Now, we just spent some time here worshiping and singing, etc. But really, it should be our whole life is one extended praise and worship service. Amen. Amen. That's how it's supposed to be, at least in some degree. It's essential. If not, of course, we can't really do that. We can't just sing for the rest of our lives. You'll lose your voice. <laughs> but also, yeah, it's not practical. But, but the, essentially, according to the essence, the like Yi. E, you okay? That's, that's what it's supposed to be. So, but there's something here that I, I really want to impart to you guys, son, because I believe you understand your call to worship. Do you guys understand that? I believe you've begun to understand that your life has no meaning whatsoever if you're not a man of prayer or a woman of prayer. I believe you guys have the understanding that if you're not a spiritual person, somebody that really walks with God and really talks to God and really learns the Word of God and listens to God and obeys God through His Word and, and, and is filled and led by the Holy Spirit and instructed and, 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 and empowered and anointed by the Holy Spirit. If you're not a spiritual person, your life is utterly meaningless. You're just a beast that perishes. Do you understand that? I believe there's an understanding that we need to pray. Sometimes you guys... Have, uh, you know, want to pray all night. You know, you, you want to go for it. You want to seek God in that way, and that's good, and that's right, and that's always the priority. I will never, um, like, belittle that or or try to pull away from that, the importance of that, because I firmly believe that is the priority, as Jesus taught with Mary and Martha. However, it's not the only part of life. You see, when Adam was in the garden, he, 
He was alone. He was perfect, but he was incomplete until God gave him Eve. Okay? And then there's something that they're not just there worshiping all day either. They're actually doing work. Adam was actually doing something. He was working. People like to work. People working is not only about making money. Of course, that's the main driving factor in most cases. But there's something within us that wants to do something. Now, normally it's driven by vanity, it's driven by ambition, it's driven by pride, but it's not all bad. Listen, little girls, when they're born, they're not born again, they play with dolls. And they like to play with babies. And they themselves are babies. Is that bad? No, it's not bad. It's showing that they were made for something. And oftentimes, little boys play with trucks. We did anyway. We play with big logging trucks. We play with cars. And we, we had hand little hammers and like to build things. My little brother, he had his whole, my, my older brother, he had his whole um, set of uh, tools and he'd go around like a, now he, that's what he does for a living. He's a construct, he does like, not construction, but like a contractor. So building, you know, houses and doing remodeling and things like that. So that's not bad, that's not sin, that's, we were made to do something, we were made to work, we were made for a task. When Jesus comes into the earth, he doesn't just teach men to worship. He teaches them to work as well. Now, all the worship was wrong at the time of Christ. So he had to completely renew their understanding of worship. It was right to worship, but they didn't have the right idea. They didn't have the right heart. They were the blind leading the blind. So Jesus said, the time is coming, coming when the Father will seek worshipers, those that worship him in spirit and in truth. He had to completely renew their idea of worship. And he did. He renewed their idea of prayer. Don't say repetitive prayers over and over again. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord does my soul to keep. Now I lay now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Hail Mary, full of grace. Blah blah blah. Just repetitive. That's what he said. Don't do that. Pray to your Father in heaven. He knows what you need. He gave us a model for prayer. He renewed the idea of prayer. As a conversation with God our Father, that was very bold. Call God your Father and your Father. By creation and by redemption, He's our Father. Call on the name of the Holy Heavenly Father. Pray to Him. Tell Him what you need. Talk to Him. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for provision. Pray His kingdom come. Pray for the glory and the honor of His name. Jesus taught how to pray. Jesus taught how to worship. And he also taught how to work. Our whole idea of life in this world has to be renewed through Jesus Christ. Why? Because we were born and raised in this world, so we already have an idea of how it's supposed to be. And it's all wrong. And it has to be completely renewed. Now, it's not wrong to work, but the motivation and the, and the outlook is wrong. Just like worship itself is not wrong, but we have to be brought into the right type of worship. So Jesus teaches his disciples right here in Matthew 4 18. He was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, cast in a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Okay, they were fishermen. That was their career, that was their job, that was their work. And then Jesus comes. Now, when Jesus comes into your life, something should change. Not just that you're no longer an animal in the sense that now you worship, now you pray. But he doesn't just, now, he's here immediately calling them to follow him. That's worship. That's prayer. That's being spiritual. But he also tells them something else. From now on, I'll make you fishers of men. That's directly referencing their work. They were fishermen. They lived in this world, and what they did was they fished for fish to make money, to feed their family, and whatever. That was their career. That was their job. 
So you're not going to do that anymore. Now you're going to fish for men. He spoke, he doesn't deny work, he renews the idea of what it's about. He doesn't deny that there's something, a task, a responsibility, something for us to do, but he completely renews the value of it. It's no longer about how much money you can make. It's no longer even about providing for your family. Don't worry about that, he told them in another place. He said, I'll take care of you. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. All those things will be added up to you. But he said, I will make you fishers of men. I'm not sure if you guys can follow this. Are you able to follow this? I'm afraid it's a little too deep. Not too deep? I hope you guys can follow. But the point is, why do you go to school? Later you'll have a job. Maybe you'll have a family. Why? Well, the world tells you it has a, its own system, its own values, its own instruction. And Jesus says, no, that's all wrong. It's not wrong to have a job. It's not wrong to do work. It's not wrong to have a family. But he denies the purpose that the world gives you for those things. Do you understand that? That's what we're saying. Those things by themselves are fine in certain circumstances. But it's the whole motivation, the whole purpose, the whole value that's placed upon it is completely and absolutely transformed and renewed and changed. And now, what was once just about making money so you could buy a bigger house or a, big, a better car or so you could have more wealth in your family center is now nothing to do with any of those things. It's now all about eternity. It's no longer about how many fish you can catch, how much money you can make but about how many souls you can save while you live on this earth. So in other words, he, he automatically he makes the bridge work, but he, he, in a temporary, temporary type of work in this world, in this life, and he automatically connects it to eternity. Souls being saved. Making, drawing people to me to worship me. Saving fallen humanity out of its state of being an animal bringing them back to the original creation to become worshipers of God. You're called now to that. That's what you're called to do. And what I want to say to you tonight is that's what you are called to do. Every single one of us who is a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ is called to how to say it in English? I'm going to think of the Chinese duh, duh, make a duh, 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 uh, how does it say? Okay, we were called to become fishers of men. We're called to no longer catch dollar bills or rubia bills or, or, or popularity or whatever uh, pleasure. We are now called to work, but we're called to work with eternity in mind. We're called to work, we're not digging for gold. You know the Chinese are famous around the world for gold. The Chinese love gold. Yes, they will give their lives, and many, many have given their lives in the pursuit of gold. In the past in America, a couple hundred years ago, there was thousands and thousands of Chinese coming to America to dig for gold. And so many died. They went like slaves. They went as the lowest coolie, the lowest type of, 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 of hard labor just to make Gold, just to find gold. And they're doing the same thing now around the world. The Chinese are going in Africa and they're digging for gold, diamonds. Man, all the risks involved. Lots of risk, lots of danger. Listen, we are called to dig for something far more valuable than gold. Gold is temporal. It's valuable only for now. We are called to dig for something that's valuable both now and later. Listen, set your sights high. Why set your, your sights on something that only has value now? Why not set your sights on something that lasts forever? Souls last forever. Do not love the world or the things in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. That's what we should be doing. The will of God. The one who has the world in mind, it's only temporal. It's the lust of the eyes. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He loves the world. He loves gold. He loves silver. He loves diamonds. He loves oil. He loves money. And they will go through every sort of obstacle and pay any sort of price so they can get their hands on some gold that eventually will rot in their body and hand. God's called us to something higher than that. God's called us to something more valuable than gold. God has called us to do the will of God because the will of God is eternal and it abides forever. So our entire outlook in life must, I say must, be renewed in this area that we look at our life even now as you're in school and later when you have a job or if you have a family, your entire outlook of why those things exist, what they're for, must be renewed. Now listen, it's not a sin to enjoy your job if you have a job that you like. That's not a sin. Um, it's not a sin to, like, we have needs, so we work to make money to provide for our needs. That's not wrong. By, that's not wrong. But our entire motivation of what we're living for must be changed, must be higher than living just like a beast. Even your work must be seen through spiritual eyes. If you have a family, it must be for the kingdom of God. If you're seeking first the kingdom of God, well, I just want to get married. Who cares what you want to do? You are no longer your own. You're bought at a price. You're a slave of Jesus Christ. It's no longer your decision what you do with your life if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, God does care about our needs, and God does give us many of the things that we like, that we want. Amen. But not all. Not all. And we accept that because we're not living for our own desires anymore, but we're living for the will of God. And if God delights that I deny myself, then I deny myself and I delight in it. And God also delights us to give us many of the desires of our hearts. But he also delights in denying us those desires so we can deny ourselves so we can glorify God. We're not living for ourselves. We're not living for our own desires. We're not living for our own uh, hopes and dreams anymore. And if you are, then you're not living for God. You're living for self. That's why Paul could say, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What this means is that whether you're a doctor, you do business, you're a teacher, a housewife, Whatever you do, you're doing it for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. Now, in Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, chapter 1, We see this presented very powerfully 
Verse 1, the, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, and the sea is not full, to the place from which the rivers come. There they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of, foreign, of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. I, the preacher, was king of Israel and Jerusalem, and I set my heart to seek and search out wisdom by concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of men by which they may be exercised. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. I commune with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness, and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has, understand, has understood great wisdom and knowledge, and I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. It's all completely empty. It's all complete vanity. All the work you do, all the attainments you have, everything you enjoy, all the pleasure, all the wisdom, all the understanding, everything, absolutely 100% empty. Vanity of vanities. It's nothing. It's rubbish. Therefore, we should live to do the will of God. But he who does the will of God abides forever. He who takes up the yoke that Jesus Christ has given and sets his course, I'm going to live for God's will. I'm going to do the works that Jesus commanded me to do. That's my life's work. That's my life's labor. That man does not live in vain. Everybody else, like an animal. That's all vanity. Absolutely no purpose to it. The famous people, the rich people, the politicians, it's all utterly vain. It's all utterly empty. There's nothing to it. It's all been done before. They're just repeating a cycle. Just repeating a cycle. And this is what the, the, the preacher has told us. It's all absolutely vain. And that's what I want to tell you. Your entire cultural background has promoted a value that is very strong. And it's all completely 100% oil. It's 100% absolutely empty and vain. And that cultural value is particularly the value of money. The value of money and making money and saving money and having money. Forget all of that. Serve Jesus Christ. Or it's all in vain. Have a family. You must have them. You're now at a certain age. You must get married. We will introduce you to this person, that person. No, it cannot be. If my child's not married, they must be married. Why? Where does that come from? What are you talking about? It's all utterly vain. It's empty. We do not live anymore for the lust of men, for the for the pride, for the praise of men, the desires of men. We know even if it's not sinful, much of it is sinful, some of it's not sinful, it's neutral, you know what I mean? It's empty, it's vain, it has nothing to it. We are called to live for the will of God. We are called to do the works that he did. We are called to become fishers of men. We are called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not seek money. 
Not seek fortune, not seek fame, not seek success, not seek to be a big businessman or a great doctor. Fine, be a doctor, be a business person, but only if God's called you to do that and you do it for His glory to reach souls. Otherwise, it's one, it's absolutely empty and in vain. It's all been done before by somebody else better than you. Why do it again? What's the value in it? There's none. It's all utter vanity. Now, turn to John 4, 1.
clean your room. They have full authority. But what they don't have authority to do is tell you what to do with your life. But they will try to do this because that's what Chinese culture does. They could suggest, and you could say, I'll pray about it. Why? Why should you pray? Because God is your master. He's your boss. He's your Lord. And you must serve him. Do you think that the father of these young men here, when Jesus called them at the lake in, in Matthew 4, do you think he wanted them to leave him alone with the work there? No, that's why they were working together with the Father. And then all of a sudden they just leave him and we're going to go preach. I don't think he was probably very happy about that. Maybe he was. Maybe he was like, oh, what an honor my children go to serve God. Great. But not always. Also, what if the parents aren't happy that you don't do it? No, you still go. Why? Because it's Jesus Christ who calls you. Jesus Christ calls you to serve him. And you must serve him. That's the point of life now. To do his will. And Jesus here, I see him almost like jumping for joy. <laughs> when you have tasted of the joy of serving somebody in the name of Jesus and helping somebody spiritually, leading somebody to Christ, or even just sharing the gospel, maybe helping another believer and encouraging them and seeing that God used you, it just so fills you with joy. <laughs> And it's like Jesus is here. I got food you guys don't even you don't know about. I have a food that's good. I don't need this other food anymore. And then he's like trying to he's pulling them into it. He says, "Do you not say there are still um, four months?" And then comes the harvest. Behold, I say, hey, "Lift up your eyes, guys. Look at the fields. They're already white for harvest. And he who receives uh, he who reaps receives wages." gathers food for eternal life. What sort of wages do you want to receive? I would like these. Thank you very much. And he who receives wages gathers fruit for eternal life. I'll take that one. The eternal life wages. Eternal wages. Lift up your eyes and see the work of God pays much better than the world pays. If you read through uh, Song Chang Jie, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, diary, he would often come across discouraged preachers that would give up preaching and go because they didn't have any money. So they would give up preaching and, and he would always encourage them, no, don't never get up, give up preaching. In fact, he was very tempted in his early years to give up his preaching because he was so poor. He, as a preacher, he was so poor and all the people around him making so much money. And he had a high education. So Zhang was a was a boy shirt. He could have had, a, he could have made a lot of money. And here he is, this poor preacher. And oftentimes he felt very sad about the normal poor preacher. But no, he had to keep, lift up his eyes and look, I'm not working for these wages of gold and silver. I'm working for wages. These wages. They, I'm gathering fruit for eternal life. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For this is this, this for in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Did you hear that word, labor? We are called to enter into labors. Every Christian, every disciple, every believer is called to enter into the labors of the Lord. And this is one of the great sources of joy in the Christian life. And I would say there's two fountains of joy. Number one, our fellowship with God, our personal direct relationship with God, worshiping God, praising God, praying to God, meditating in His Word, studying the Word, studying the Scripture, hearing the Word, listening to sermons, letting God speak to you and minister to you and bless you, being filled with His Holy Spirit and being, being uh, just... His word just, uh, just bringing revelation into your heart, revelation into your life. That's one of the great founts of the Christian joy. But one of the other ones, we see it right here in the life of Jesus. Doing the will of the Father. 
spiritual work, soul winning work, drawing people to Christ, preaching the gospel for Christ of Christ. So you would understand what I'm saying. I would almost want to say to you, you are called to be a pastor. But that's not what I mean. But just to get your mindset right, I would almost say you're called to be a missionary. You'd be like, what would you do all of a sudden? You're, oh, I'm called to be a missionary. What would you do? You would think, man, I've got to study the Bible more. <laughs> I've got to get up early. I've got to start praying more. I've got to really work on my life. Exactly. So that's what I mean, except the expression of it maybe isn't that you will be a pastor. But it doesn't matter. Because whatever you do is only a platform for winning souls. Whatever we do in this world is only meant to be a platform to lead people to Christ, to be a witness for Jesus Christ, to speak for Jesus Christ. Even if you make a lot of money, what's that money for? So you can buy more bigger houses, better things? No. That's not what it's for. It's for the kingdom of God. You're just a, a channel of resources for service in the kingdom of God. If all of the resources in the hands of Christians, if they would use them according to how God has designed them, What sort of things could we do for God? I mean, if all of the resources in the hands of Christians around the world, if they were willing to release those for a greater purpose, for God's purpose, and not try to control them with their own greedy, greed, selfish greed, and just desire for pleasure and material things, I mean, there was so much good that could be done in the name of Christ. With all the wealth that's been given, especially over the past several hundred years in the West, in America, in Europe, just billions and billions of dollars that have been in the hands of Christians. So much of it was spent in living luxurious lifestyles. God have mercy. Rather, and use it to build up the kingdom of God. Missionaries starve while wealthy Christians live in their mansions back home. So often, that's what happens. Because people do not have a right understanding that whether you're called to be a missionary or a pastor or a worker, a housewife, a doctor, or a businessman, it doesn't matter. This, this, <clears throat> essentially, we're called to the exact same thing. <clears throat> to be fishers of men. To live for the will of God. What is the purpose of your life? I want to tell you tonight clearly, as clear as I can, with the help of God, the purpose of your life is twofold. It's to walk with God, to know God, worship God, live for God, seek God, pray to God, praise God, live a holy life before God as part of your worship. And it's to serve God and do His will and do His works. See. Jesus had, God only has one son. And his son came into this world and was a missionary, a preacher, a shepherd. If we are sons of God, how are we going to live? Now, Jesus wasn't always a full-time preacher. He was a carpenter before. But his entire life, 
Even when he was a carpenter, he was living for a greater purpose. He wasn't living just to build things out of wood. So it's not a point about am I a full-time preacher or am I a teacher in school. That's not the point. Why are you a teacher in school? It should be so you can win souls for Christ. It should be so you make money, you can give more money. Yes, provide for your family. That's a part of it. That's part of your ministry. That's part of you have to provide certain needs or whatever. But you have to have a kingdom mindset, not a selfish mindset, not a worldly mindset. A long-term, eternal mindset. Long-term, again, long-term until the end of your life. Forget it. We're, we're way beyond that. We're looking way beyond the end of our lives. We're looking in for a million years in the future, 10 million years in the future, eternity. When you compare your life 80 years maybe to that, this is like just a nothing. You are going to live forever. Would you spend your one stint on this earth, your one chance, your one life on this earth? For this earth or for the world to come? It's pretty, pretty obvious the answer. But what's the purpose of your life? The purpose of your life is that you know God. And the secondary purpose of your life is to do God's works. Ora et labor. What sort of work? Winning souls. Serving church. Maybe making money, why? So, or, so when I'm at work, I can evangelize and I can use the money from God's kingdom. There you go, there you got it, you got it. God has called me to be a doctor. Good, that's possible, I believe it's possible. Why not? So that I can influence all the doctors with the gospel and so that I can make money and then I'm gonna use the money and then I'm gonna give it to missions. I'm gonna give it for souls. I'm, Good, do it. I'm also going to serve in the church. I'm going to sing in the choir. I'm going to sing on the worship. I'm going to help with this. I'm going to help with that. Good. That's right. That's what you're supposed to do. Serve God. Do His will. Do what is important to Him and His kingdom. We must live our lives in a way that has purpose both for now and eternity. Remember Paul said this, he said, for bodily exercise, profits a little. Bodily exercise, like I'm going to do lots of exercise. It profits, he said, a little. Like you feel like healthier, maybe, or whatever. But he said, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. That's how we're to live. For something that glorifies God both now and in eternity. For something that has value both now and eternity. What is that? Knowing God and doing His work. That's what you're called to. As a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ, that is the high calling of your life. To glorify God by worshiping Him and serving Him. Go ahead and turn to 1 John 2.15. I already read the verse, but I'd like to just read it again. It's a very powerful verse. And I think it really speaks into what we're talking about tonight. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Listen, do the will of God. Do the will of God. Worship God and do his works. Give your life 
to keep his commandments. Listen, I don't mean just oh, love one another, that's one of his commandments. Yes, one, but he gave other commandments. I go into all the world and preach the gospel, didn't he? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He's called us. He said, I have food to eat. I have food. I have food to eat of which you do not know. But he wants them to know it. And I believe that the Lord, it's almost in us, it's saying to us tonight, that he has food to eat that you have not yet tasted. But he wants you to taste it. You have tasted of worship. You've tasted of prayer. You've tasted of praise. You've tasted of the word good. You will be take, drinking from that fountain the rest of your life. But there's another fountain that he wants you to taste of doing his works. And you also need to be engaged in that for the rest of your life. That is, if you don't, you 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 miss you miss God. Ora et labora. It's not just praising and worshiping. Because why? What will happen is this: if you think of your life as a Christian, as well, I'm not a pastor, so I go to church and I pray and I do a little bit of things in the church, but then I go and do my job because I'm not a pastor. I'm a normal person. What will happen is then you will become secular. You will become carnal. Your job, the money, the, you will think of it more as for yourself. God's never called anybody to live life like that. Nobody in his kingdom is called to live for themselves. We're all called to live for the, equally for the kingdom of God. We have different positions externally, but the heart is supposed to be the same. You have to look at it no matter what I do the rest of my life, whether I, whether, whether I eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So, so you are called, if you're called to be a teacher, for example, or you're called to be a, business, a businessman or something like that, um, then you are called to do that spiritually. You're not called to just, well, that's what me and my family, that's what we do, we just, we go to school and then we work at this company. That's not the case for you anymore, because now Jesus has claims on your life. Maybe that was the case before, but not anymore. It's changed now. How? Because Jesus is Lord, and he's Lord of your life. That includes how you spend your life do with your life. Now, it's possible maybe he would just have you work with your family or family business or whatever may be the case. It's possible but the point is, is that what Jesus wants or not? That's what is the, the, the determining factor. Not what your family wants, not even what you want, but what God wants. And what what, what he um, what his kingdom needs are so you're called to be a missionary. Just go ahead and settle it right now. You're called to be a full-time missionary. The rest of your life is supposed to be for serving God, just like I am serving God. Except the difference is you might not be preaching like I'm preaching. But you will be called, you are called to, uh, to be a fisher of men. You are called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are called to do kingdom works. It may mean that you are called to preach. It may mean that you are called to go out in a jungle somewhere and preach the gospel and be rejected and die. But it certainly means that God does not just have a religious life for you in the sense that I will go to church and I will pray. No, that's not enough. He wants all of your life, including your work life. God made Adam and Eve in the garden to work. God calls us to work. What work? His work. We are all now called to do the works that he has appointed for us. Everything must be renewed. Our whole understanding, our whole outlook must be renewed or you will fall into the trap of being a lukewarm Christian. What's a lukewarm Christian? One who compartmentalizes his life. I have the spiritual life, which is church and that, and I do read my Bible and pray, but now this is my life where I do my own thing. I do my job, I do my business, I do my career, I do I make my money, I do it. It's all mine. No, you're deceived. That's not the case. It's not yours. You're not supposed to be living that way anyways. You're supposed to be living that whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, it's for the glory of God. 
So even if you get a job or don't get a job, if you work, you don't, whatever, it's supposed to be that God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do your works, whatever they show me. So now you're in preparation to be a missionary. And what I'm trying to say is also, that's one of the great sources of joy in your life. When you have that perspective, you can make even the, mon the mundane things pleasant when you know I'm doing it for God. Maybe even now in your studies, why are you studying? Well, you have to. Well, no, you don't. I mean, you could run away from home. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to do it. Do it now for the glory of God. I'm studying because I'm going to serve God. And somehow the knowledge that I learn, the classes I take, that stuff like that, it's just do it for the Lord. Really do it for the Lord. Like, whatever you learn now, it's going to, it's kind of training your intellectual life and discipline and your life and things like that for the rest of your life. So do it now for the glory of God. It's going to help you whether, no matter what you do in the future. But have that perspective. I'm doing it for God. You are doing it for God. If you choose to serve God, then you'll do it for God. Not to make more money. That's a ridiculous thing. There's something far greater than that. And that is to win souls and to do God's will. Because he who does the will of God abides forever. So, you are called. Listen. What I'm telling you is true. I don't know if you guys have even been able to follow or understand exactly what I'm saying. But God will not be satisfied if you just pray. You have to do His works as well. And you will not be satisfied if you just pray. Because then what will happen? You will become worldly. You must understand, from the moment where you are saved, for the rest of your life, God wants to control, to guide, and direct everything in your life. You are now called as his disciple, and he will send you forth into the harvest to reap a harvest. You have to have that mindset or you're going to fail. You're going to miss God. Understand that you're called to be a laborer together with Christ. You're called to be a preacher of the gospel, whether that be from a pulpit or just sharing one of the little people or being an intercessor and praying for people. You know, John Hyde, whatever. But the rest of your life, you were called to walk with Christ in fellowship, in a relationship, in holiness. But you're also called to do His works in reaching out to people and doing the ministry that He's called you to do. You must have this mindset or your Christian life cannot come to maturity or fullness. And you also will miss out on the joy the fountain of joy that comes that Jesus is rejoicing in in his life when he was on earth and serving the Samaritan woman and serving the people you'll miss it in your life. So you're called to be fishers of men. Jesus Christ the Lord who called you to salvation is now also calling you to walk with him and do his works. To be a spiritual soul winner. To be like a, a missionary. To do his works, to even evangelize your little brother. I mean, even to, to, to begin in praying and interceding for people that are lost around you. I don't, I, your classmates, your, you have got to understand this is a, is a, it's a good thing to do it. Now we're on fire and you want to do it good. But what I'm saying is it even goes beyond whether you're on fire or not, but it goes into the, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're called to do. That's what God 
has ordained you to do. So many times people have a false idea that becoming a Christian just means you give up your sins and now you live a good life. No, you don't just give up your sins, you give up your life. Well, so then what now? So now you live for what God wants you to live for. I'm going to show you some verses. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5. From, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. And then we're going to go to Acts. Remind me of Acts. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. So that means his dying for us, for our sins, and he covers all of our sins, and all died. Our whole life died, because he died for us. That means the life that we should be judged for has been crucified together with him on the cross. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That is a powerful verse. That is such a powerful verse. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Acts chapter 20, verse, let's look, start in verse uh, 20. How I kept back, this is when Paul met with the Ephesian elders, and this is last time visiting, last time seeing them, he's giving them his final words. How I kept back. Nothing that was helpful. I proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in, in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Listen to this. This is amazing. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. In other words, I'm not living for myself. I'm living for him that died for me. So that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Do you hear that? The things Paul was preaching in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians that we just read? This is what he actually lives. None of these things move me. I'm not afraid to die. I'm not worried about what's going to happen to me there. All I care about is that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That's what I'm living for. That's all there is to live for. And that's what we are now called to live for. Let's look at Acts 26. Paul's telling the king of Greba how he was called. And in verse 15 he says, this is what the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance of those who are sanctified by faith in me. The Lord appeared to him, revealed himself to him, knew him, and then gave him this commission. Now I'm sending you. First he saves Paul, forgives his sins, fills him with the Holy Spirit, 
and now sends him out. Now, the Lord will keep appearing to him. He's going to have that ongoing relationship with God, but now he has a word to him. So it's not just one part. We have to understand that Christian life was never just one part. Like, oh, well, I just have to stop sinning. Yes, you have to stop sinning. But that's only one part. You also have to serve God. Your life is no longer your own. It's been bought into Christ. So serve God with the rest of your lives. Amen. All right, let's pray.